So how many people in here have an emergency department information system? Okay. How many people in here that emergency department information system is what you would consider a best of breed? In other words, it does, isn't part of your hospital-wide health information system. Okay, so the other people, it's all part of your health information system. So Epic, Cerner, McKesson, one of those. Okay, that is the trend. Um, and uh, what I think IT people have uh, figured out is that you really can't make doctors happy. So if you can't make them happy, then they're going to do what's the cheapest. All right, or the least expensive, I should say. And uh, so the trend, and I get, you know, in the last two to three years, I get multiple requests about this. I'm going to talk a little bit about that and, and how to mitigate that as well. So how did I end up uh, as a physician executive with Microsoft? It's kind of a, a long story. You heard about me falling off the roof. And uh, so I actually went to my Microsoft interview in a wheelchair two weeks after having surgery. And so I, I've accused them of being afraid not to hire me because it was one of those ADA things. And uh, so um, I had left clinical practice, as I mentioned, because of the liability issues, um, was basically living the good life. Uh, Microsoft acquired a product that had been developed by a couple of emergency physicians that were friends of mine, and they called me up and said, you know, this is going on, why don't you come play with Microsoft? And I thought, well, what a great way to get free software. And uh, so I've been playing with Microsoft for about the last uh, three years on a variety of things. Now, having said that, um, you know, for full disclosure, we don't have an emergency department information system. We don't sell one. And so what I'm going to talk about today is really unrelated to uh, what Microsoft is doing in health. So just uh, FYI, this is something I have been doing for many years. In fact, was uh, going back to 1989. Uh, one of the um, founding uh, members of the ASAP computer section. And uh, so, uh, again, have written and lectured uh, widely uh, for, for many years. Okay? The uh, gremlins are uh, killing me today. There we go. So um, by way of resources, um, and again, this should be in your handout. If it's not, let me know. I'd be happy to email it to you. Um, this is one of our preliminary documents. Uh, been updated a few times on the view of the emergency department of the future. Um, we have just within the last year uh, created a ASEP policy on healthcare informatics and now created a white paper on emergency department information systems. So these are um, uh, assets that you now have that you can use with your hospital administration um, if you are having challenges or if you are planning on installing, purchasing, or changing your emergency department information system. So I um, highly recommend that you, you look at those uh, if you're in that situation or just if you're just in general interest. So going back to about 1994, we had developed this concept of the emergency department of the future, leveraging technology, and we actually um, had the opportunity to display that at the 1994 ASIP Scientific Assembly. Interestingly enough, it was at Walt Disney World, um, which was kind of cool. Um, so that was the first time it was presented. Um, we also, uh, as a part of a grant, um, so I, I went across the, the world actually lecturing for free and talking about this, promoting it. Um, my uh, compadre, Ed Barthel, another emergency physician and founding member of the section, went out and got a $25 million grant to actually build it. And uh, so part of that grant was the emergency department of the future video, uh, which we're not going to show today, but if you would like a copy of that, let me know, and I'd be happy to uh, send you a DVD for, for $5 shipping and handling. Um, so um, this was uh, in 1996 when we uh, again came back and, and did an exhibit uh, on the floor, uh, and again, as I mentioned, I went across the world talking about it, and there I am in Spain talking. Um, it was interesting at this lecture, uh, or this, this meeting, um, this is again in 1999, and what's the, the Andalusian government in Spain was trying to figure out is how do we deliver health care with new technologies, and particularly over the internet. So they were really, I think, uh, well ahead of the rest of, uh, of the world at, at that time. So um, again, if you want more information, I have an EDIS compendium, which is everything I've collected, written, and so forth, and I'd be happy to send that to you. Um, if you want scribe information, I'll talk about that a little bit too. Um, if you are about to um, implement or looking at a particular system, and so for example, if you want to know about Cerner, I have collected the email threads that I participated in over the years and be happy to send those to you as well. They're not my comments, these are just unwashed comments from everybody else, so you don't have to sort of start that all over again. Um, and uh, again, I, I don't give out the lecture slides, sorry about that, or if you want the video, let me know. All right, 
So that it will ever come into use notwithstanding its value is extremely doubtful because its beneficial application requires much time, gives a good bit of trouble both to the patient and the practitioner. Now you might think you're talking about an EDIS here, right? But actually this talking about the stethoscope back in 1834. Um, and, uh, <laughs> So again, uh, things change over time and become easier. So the point of that, I think, is that just because you can do something with a computer doesn't mean that you should. So I mean, for other people that are uh, what Sherry calls the pocket protector geeks, you know, um, my wife is always after me. You know, you know, why are you, you know, looking at screensavers of the beautiful ocean, you know, instead of here in Hawaii actually looking at the real ocean? And uh, so um, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. So here's another quote, in attempting to arrive at the truth, I've looked at everywhere for information, but the scarcity of an instance that I've been able to obtain the hospital records fit for any purpose of comparison. If that could be obtained, they would show how their money was spent, what um, uh, amount of good was uh, really being done with it, or whether the money was not doing mischief rather than good. And uh, so again, you might think that was about the modern day uh, technology, but that was actually written by Florence Nightingale. All right, so again, these issues have been around for a long, long time. So I'm gonna talk about five or so dirty little secrets of healthcare IT in general and emergency department information systems in general. The first is that it's actually been shown now that there's very little benefit to electronic health records. What do you mean benefit? Cost savings, quality improvement, and in fact, there's some mounting evidence that they do the opposite. Okay? So the promise of healthcare IT has to date not materialized. So you ask yourself, well, why is that? And this is my theory, and I believe it to be true, is that these transaction systems, okay, so the systems that you're putting stuff in, you know, you're putting a documentation in, you're, doc you're, you're putting lab orders, a CPOE and so forth, are creating more data silos. Data silos in and of themselves do not help. When you connect that data, that's where I believe we'll begin to see the benefit. And we're not there yet. Um, so uh, we're working on it. The other dirty little secret is when we reach a world in which the average piece of information is never looked at by a human, we need to know how to evaluate everything automatically to decide what should get the precious resources. So I believe in healthcare, this happened 10 years ago. We can produce more information that is humanly possible in the hospital to look at. And so we all know these examples, right? It's the callback. It's the, you know, the, the plaintiff's attorney that has a whole month or a whole half a year to look at the chart and find those little nuggets that would have made the difference and saved the patient's life. We don't have that luxury to be able to do that. And in fact, I believe that in large part, the productivity losses with the implementation of emergency department information systems is that we now have the ability to look at so much stuff and we feel compelled to do that. And it's not well organized, it's not well automated. So again, another dirty little secret, all right? Um, this is uh, so an interesting debate arose. This is about an emergency department information system that was actually being done uh, in a, uh, um, it, it's not in the US, but it was uh, actually in Australia in a region. So an interesting debate arose on electronic list. A clinician reported the productivity outcome for EDS for his rural practice. From my point of view, the rollout has been overwhelmingly success. I get a typewritten discharge letter, about 30% of ED discharge within two days. This is an incredible achievement compared with a handwritten, indecipherable, quadruplet copy three months after. So the, one of the emergency physicians in responding to that said this, said, well, my neighbor's house is burning down with an overwhelming success. Uh, by that I mean I get a nice free warmth radiating to my property that could even roast a few potatoes on the fringes of it. The benefit of misfortune of others. So again, there are benefits to these, often on the backs of physicians and other providers that are doing the work. I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to show you how to mitigate that and show you how to be successful. All right, so it's, you're going to seem like I'm not in favor of this. It's kind of unusual coming from a guy working for Microsoft, right? Well, the fact is, again, just because you can do something with computer doesn't mean you should. And if you are going to do it, you should do it the right way. Those two things don't often happen. So what do you think? You know, are you early adopters? Only 11% have actually fully implemented electronic health records in hospitals. 57%, um, and this could be all over the place. And in fact, uh, Gartner, um, who uh, is actually, oh, I'm sorry, this is HIMSS, has seven stages of healthcare IT implementation. Actually, eight stages, because they started with zero. They realized they left one out, so they went back to zero. All right, and if you look at this, 
people are only about halfway through as far as will benefit and the, the technologies, all right? So very few people up in here. So we, we still have a long way to go on some of that stuff. And in fact, um, about 8% of EHRs are actually implemented and taken out because um, they w were not able to make it work. Um, sorry to interrupt, but I must congratulate you on how up to date you are because that quote regarding the house burning down appeared in the paper only two weeks ago and it was regarding the serving Okay, I wasn't going to mention particular. I could, yeah. Because <laughs> it's not, a, it's actually not important who the vendor is because these things happen with all different vendors. But you're obviously from Australia, mm. right? Okay, all right. So you, yeah. So you, you were. Uh, well, I'll talk about you in a minute. All right. <laughs> all right. So um, this, this is, I'm going to talk about some tales from the crypts. These are just some of the emails that I've, you know. So this guy says, I've had the displeasure of using whatever, okay? And it was a phase, and they did sort of a few things right. But he just says, you know, it's taking too much time. You're wasting five minutes per chart. One of the sales reps bragged that the chart could be completed in three minutes, so they got their best guy on the line, and it took them 10 minutes to do it. Right? Their best guy. So I had the same experience. I mean, I was uh, um, uh, this victim for a while, and, and I had the same thing. And I, the, the guy that um, had invented this particular product was an emergency physician, and I sidelined him. I said, you know, it, the best I can do is about 11 minutes on creating a chart. Previously, it was about three, maybe four minutes on a complicated chart dictating, or even less if you're doing a, a template. And he says, oh, well, you're not doing it right. So I'm doing it the way your people Taught, taught us in, in the uh, implementation. He says, oh yeah, don't pay attention to that. Let me show you how to do it, <laughs> right? And then so he says, you know, create this template and you just insert all this text and then you take out the stuff you didn't do. Charting by deletion, right? Great idea, right? Okay, it's such a great idea, and because you know I was involved with them tall and so forth, I was asked to review a case where um, a chart from this particular um, vendor, again, it doesn't matter the vendor, it happens with all of them, was pristine. It's like the best chart I've ever seen. In fact, the review of systems had 100 elements. I mean, really, that's unbelievable. The problem was the chief complaint was cardio respiratory arrest. So I'm sure they didn't have back pain, they were dead. All right, so that creates some issues with regard to some fraud and some other things you know, beyond that, all right? So, um, so again, this, this is one where they've taken the monolithic approach. In other words, they're being forced to use the, the offering from their health information systems being used system-wide, and they're being forced to use that. And uh, so um, they actually turned the product off, and, and that's happened a few times too, but it's also happened with best of breeds, all right? So these guys were seeing up to four patients per hour. He says, throw in a lousy documentation system across multiple computers, and suddenly you're down to two. Um, okay, uh, how many people believe that you could actually lose your contract with the hospital over an emergency department information system implementation? Were you a victim? You just heard about it? Okay, so it happens, and in this particular case, the group said, hey, this isn't going to work for us. They refused to cooperate. The hospital says, well, we'll find somebody who does. The contract manager group that they hired said, oh, yeah, we'll do all this stuff. And as it turns out, they came in and couldn't do it either, all right, uh, after all that hoopla. So this guy says, I'd like a copy of, of your uh, um, compendium for my headstones. This thing's killing me, all right. Uh, so let me give you some, uh, some of the best advice that, that I have. I'm going to just tell you this up front, all right. So it's less important what you buy than how it's selected, implemented, and managed. Okay, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. You know, okay, um, the biggest mistake people are made is to assume that a commercial EDIS can do everything well. It doesn't exist. Um, EDIS, you know, that's why I just said that. Um, decide what you want, then what you need, and buy somewhere in between. Okay. Do the things for which EDS is well suited. For example. A computer documentation for physicians will typically cause a reduction in productivity between 15 to 30 percent. It's not well suited for that, and we'll talk about that, and we'll talk about scribes and how you can mitigate that. 
Unwashed comments can be useful, but again, understand that they are unwashed comments. Everybody has a different experience, and it's not always the vendor's fault. Okay? Learn how to do it right, and I'm just going to promote the annual Pennsylvania ASAP EDS Symposium, which we'll talk, I'll show you in just a second. All right? So that's sort of some general advice. Uh, also, the ASAP section, uh, we have a listserv where if you have a question, those are the, some of the comments that I've collected over the years. Um, even the best EDS can fail due to poor implementation and training. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, because even lame EDS is because we have really smart people that work in emergency departments can make it work. Um, in fact, I was the chief medical officer for MediServe, which had a product called EdNet. It was one of the very first EDISs. It was really bad, but we, had, we couldn't pry it out of the hands of people because they understood it, they liked it, and it worked. All right, um, and ultimately, um, you know, it, it went away. But again, people know what they like, and they like what they know. So really, it's how you do it than what you do. All right, if you ask the right questions, you will get the right answers. That's what I'm trying to help you sort through today. Okay, so what you really want doesn't exist. You need it's important to know what works, what's available, and what will work in your merge Because people ask me this all the time. Well, which one should I buy? You're a smart guy. You've investigated this. You've been at this for 20 years. What should I buy? Well, it's kind of like saying, well, what kind of car do you want? You know, are you going through a midlife crisis? You need the vet, right? You got, you got five kids? Yeah, you're gonna need a minivan. Really depends, so each, each institution is different. It also depends largely on what your, your health information system for your hospital wide is as well. Okay, so there've been great EDI successes and unmitigated disasters with exactly the same system. Okay, believe that, it's happened. And it all has to do with what I said before, it's the selection, implementation, and the training and ongoing maintenance. Okay, so the five uh, most common phrases spoken in the emergency department are, where's that pick an expletive chart? How much longer is it gonna be? Okay, the blood was hemolyzed. Uh, we're short staffed today. And, oh yeah, remember that patient? All right, so let me talk about some things that you can do other than an EDIS that will make a dramatic uh, improvement. How many people are using digital radiography now? Okay, how many people are not? Okay, so a couple, uh, I mean, just even three years ago, it would be the other way around. Um, you can't afford not to use this, uh, and it really is one of those things that changed my practice. So all of a sudden, we had digital radiography, and our x-ray readings were being done in Australia. They were being done all around the world, because it's always daylight somewhere. I would oftentimes get the written report back before the patient came back from CT. And it was being read by a C, not only a CT radiologist, but a neuro CT radiologist or an abdominal CT radiologist or the super specialist. So it's really cool. So really radiology is changing in that they're going to be doing interventional stuff locally and everything else is going to be read across the world. All right, scan paper. Okay, you will never get away from paper. Believe me. If you don't believe me, the next time you go to the bathroom, figure it out. All right, you will not get away from paper. So you have to find a way to, to capture that. Point of service lab, which a lot of people use, Dictate a visit abstract, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. What's a visit abstract? A visit abstract is the stuff that you want the next guy to know, sort of the bullet. This is the important stuff, the stuff that I would tell you if I was on the phone, right? And then use other technologies to collect all that other stuff for billing and all the stuff that nobody really cares about. I mean, if I were a primary care physician or less so maybe an inpatient, you know, hospitalist, and I had to read through all that billing stuff, you know, all those review systems, it would just drive me crazy because I just really want to know what the essence of the patient is. Most of us are using medication dispensing systems and then just pray that no one else dies for lack of information. So let me talk about that. So this was actually the first x-ray taken at Mary Hitchcock Hospital in the United States. And at the 100th anniversary, they had this ceremony and they put this plaque up and all that kind of stuff. So the residents the next day celebrated in a little bit different way, celebrating the first lost x-ray. All right. Uh, so again, digital radiography has pretty much uh, eliminated that as a problem. Poor man's EMR. Okay. You know what this stuff is called NCR paper? What does it stand for? National Cash Register. No, actually, it's owned by National Cash Register. It stands for no carbon required. How much does that cost? A lot? Yeah, it depends on what your bulk pricing is, but it could be anywhere from 25 cents to up to 75 cents per packet. So I just tell people, instead of turning this over and writing notes on it, just take a dollar bill out of your pocket and write the note on that. It's the same difference. So get rid of this stuff, you know, and just scan the paper. It's the poor man's EMR. Use templates if you have to or whatever, okay? Um, we talked about point of service labs. You guys are familiar with that kind of stuff. You'll hear more about that. 
dictating a visit abstract. So again, we have, do, do what makes sense to do on a computer, do what makes sense on a template, and then do that visit abstract. Now, Rick Bucata will tell you that that's what they've been doing for years. It's worked out for him. I've been talking about this for more than 15 years. Um, so, you know, you can actually have the patient do a lot of this as well. Have them fill out the review of systems on a piece of paper and just scan the paper. You don't care. What you want to do is get that information to the biller so that you can get the maximum allowable documentation. And then dictate that visit abstract that tells the next day. So, in reality, the problem with a lot of EDIS is, is it forces people to chart in a monolithic way. And each patient is different, each emergency department is different, each physician is different. And I hear a lot of complaints, and actually had this issue with my department, I was the medical director, I knew what the per physician per hour worked, uh, per, per patient per hour worked was. 2.4, 2.4 patients per hour on average for my group for 15 to 20 years. We installed an emergency department information system and it went to 1.8, costing us 30,000 or more dollars a month in lost productivity. It never recovered to this day. And what happened was now a lot of people, you know, like me, I just gave up after a while and stopped doing it. But now the newbies, you know, the, the kids that grew up with computers still do it and they love it. They love it. One person seeing 1.1 patients per hour doing 100% of their charge in the EDIS. I love that too. Right? But I need to move the meat. And so while I'm seeing patients, they're playing with the computer. Uh, so it can be issues and you have to uh, manage that. So if only one and a half percent loss of physician productivity will completely eliminate all of the return on investment for an EDIS, if you're doing for physician charting, because you want to get rid of transcription, right? right? And you're creating stuff that no one will look at. Only one and a half percent. Talk more about that in a minute. We, we, we need to talk about uh, Pixis. Um, it's, but it is interesting <clears throat> that, that more than just controlling the medic, you know, do you guys used to have these little drawers that you just pull out and you take medications? It's sort of like the, the local ED pharmacy and everybody just took what they needed, right? Well, this sort of changed that, but it did more than that. So for example, at one hospital that was trying to comply with the CMS core measures on aspirin, they didn't have CPOE, they didn't have an uh, electronic medication administration record, they didn't have Pixis. So they knew that aspirin was taken out, so they assumed it was, and that allowed them to automate that process. So there's a lot of good information that comes from these things. All right, and then finally, pray. All right, because unfortunately, um, we're still at that early stage in information systems for healthcare. Now, I don't know if anybody saw this yet, but I actually sent this into the Jay Leno show and it, was, it made it on the show and, and you know, it's just in the newspaper. So this is the, you know, the Pope and um, that's actually the collar of the guy standing right behind him. Or is it? All right for those Catholics in the room. So this is my strategic vision, that for every piece of information that patient enters or is automatically captured, that's one step closer to an effective and cost-efficient ED solution. I don't think we'll ever truly have success until we collect information. It may need to be more than 50%, right? That's the goal, that's where we need to get. Um, and again, I do believe that if patients are gonna be waiting any amount of time, that they could do that themselves with the appropriate technology help us do that. All right, so well, the challenge is that this is fraught with pitfalls. You know, you have to buy for this year, not next, because the future is uncertain. I've been saying now for 15 years there's going to be consolidation in the best of breed emergency department information systems. Every year when I go to the PAA set meeting, there would be another vendor, another vendor. It continues to expand. And then the, the uh, HIS people got into it. So now there's like 25 or 26 vendors out there. Way too many people. Nobody can make money at it, and so there's no innovation. It, there has to be a consolidation. We'll see what happens. I think a lot of them are hanging on because of the stimulus money to thinking that there's going to be some money there. So after that plays out, we'll see. Consultants can bring value, or they can make things worse. All right, read the handout and see my opinions about that. Much of the success of the project, though, is the commitment of the development team and the willingness to dedicate adequate resources. What does dedicate adequate resources mean? That means people human resources, it means money, all right, and it means doing the work, all right, and uh, we'll talk about that as well. All right, 
So, ch uh, so challenge the commitment for the hospital to do it right if you have that choice. And you, you, having a good relationship with your IT department, if you're the medical director or whatever, is extremely, and we were talking at dinner last night with, with Sherry, that she could get the IT people to do stuff for her that they wouldn't do for anybody else because when they did the work and they gave it to her, they saw the results. Okay, she actually did good things with what they're doing, so it made them part of the team. So you should send these guys Christmas cards, all right? So have the courage to face, ask the hard questions, expect administration to commit and follow through. So what do I mean by that? So if, for example, you're maybe using an EDIS now, or you're not using EDIS, and they're putting in a new health information system, or they're going to deploy the current health information system ED, ED, ED module in the emergency department, that's the most common thing. So sit down, think about that, and write the criteria for success, okay? The criteria for success, all right, we will have adoption of 85% by this time. We will improve ED throughput. We will decrease wait times. We will do all this stuff. If you get the right list and you get administration to say, that's what we'll do, that's what we'll commit to, then after about a month to six weeks of that implementation, when it's not working well, you can take that back into them and say, you know what, I think we need to step back. Okay, our ED triage times have gone through the roof. Our left without treatments, our left without treatments went from 0.5% to 8.5%. Right? Um, so you can go back and say, you know what? We did it, we gave our best, we're just not quite ready. All right? If you get down there. Now it's best to, to get a good system that you don't have to do that. But again, do that paperwork. All right? uh, otherwise you're going to make your life miserable and, and even your patients as well. All right. So Bob Wears, Alzheimer's physician, uh, wrote this in JAMA, said a vision of organizational change has to precede IT system implementation, recognizing that clinical IT projects are incredibly complex social endeavors in an unforgiving environment that happen to involve computers, as opposed to IT projects that involve physicians. So you may have heard me talk about behaviors before, exactly the same thing in IT. All right. You're dealing with doctors. Nobody in here went to medical school because they wanted somebody to tell them what to do. Right? Right. So, and I'm married to a physician. So I, I can tell you, it, it's, it's really, it can be an issue. And uh, so, um, trust me on that. All right. So this guy says, I've checked your computer, sir. The tech problem is between your keyboard and your chair. <laughs> right? So, the EDI says it's all about managing human behavior, not adopting technology. So, uh, yeah, it's confusing. That's the price we pay for choice. Um, in your handout is a list, I keep that up to date, of all the systems that I know about, in case you're going out shopping and you need a shopping list. Okay? Um, also other resources, I mentioned the computer section, we have a newsletter and also CLOS, which is an analyst group similar to the Gartner, Gartner group that's meeting here, and they actually have done individual assessments of emergency department information systems. All right, useful information, pretty expensive, like $100,000, but understand what it is. It's sort of a public opinion poll. All right, it's a Mikey likes it. They really don't go in and do a consumer, and I've heard it compared to a consumer reports. It is not a consumer reports. I'm not saying it's not valuable. I'm just saying it's not consumer reports. They go and they talk to people who have used these systems. Do you like it? Was the vendor responsive? You know, yada, yada, yada. And also look at some pricing and, and, and costs and so forth. All right, so it's useful information, but it's not consumer reports. They're not going to be able to tell you. And just because it's listed number one in class does not necessarily mean it's the one for you. All right, I mentioned this, unfortunately, this year because of the economic downturn. They did cancel the meeting this year, but it will be again uh, next year. I think it's going to be in the November time frame, 2010. So if you're interested or if you're in that situation, that's a great place to go and talk to people and for four days learn everything you're going to need to know. This is just really the, uh, the uh, hors d'oeuvres, all right? So why are EDS not meeting our needs? Jim Adams put it this way, most current EDSs and other healthcare IT for that matter are focused on data management rather than process control methodology. They're all about creating and storing data rather than process workflow change. Now, process workflow change oftentimes happens and is the IT is the impetus for that, right? Because, well, we're putting in the, the IT system, so we should probably fix these other things. Or we have to fix these other things because of the IT. I have never, I have never seen an IT system in and of itself improve an emergency department. Okay, listen to that very carefully. I've, it doesn't happen. 
In fact, it often happens the opposite, all right? So a friend of mine put it this way, though. He says, after his Jayco visit, said, did Jayco and CMS sit down in a room and figure out how many things they had to require to force us to use technology? And it seems that way sometimes. If you think this is bad, wait till they get to 120 core, core measures. You can't do that with the sneaker net anymore. You're going to have to have systems that automatically capture and report this data. It's coming. How do you do this stuff? Look at this just for one complaint. All this stuff that you have to... You, EKG must be read within six minutes, let alone doing that. How about documenting that? How's that going to happen? All right, this is real challenges that are coming up. So how many people here are doctors, physicians? Okay, most. Anybody? Nurses? A few nurses? Good. Um, medical records people? Okay, well, they're on the list to make fun of. ED managers? All right, are off the list. Any IT people? Oh, good. All right. Any administrators? I mean, there's probably some overlap here, so some of you may be nurse or physician administrators. All right. Um, that, that helps a little bit. So um, what do you want in an IT system? How many people want it to be user-friendly? Sure. How many people want to just replace the paper? Okay. How many people just want to integrate with legacy systems? We've gotten all these other things. We want to just bring it all together. Yeah. All right. Um, how many people are using some sort of passive tracking or automated tracking? Really? Okay, a couple people, good. I've been talking about that for years, and that's one thing you can do that will really improve your, and we'll, we'll talk more about that in a minute. All right, so we already talked about this. Well, you're ahead of the curve. Really, only about 35% of EDs have sort of a full implementation of EDIS. Actually, it's less than about 10% full. Um, anybody implementing currently? One? All right, um, how many people, well, we talked about this, but how many people were forced to use the ED module? Yeah, okay. Well, there's the paper um, that if, if you want to read this, but this is, this is the vomit syndrome, which is the victims of medical information technology. I just love Macintosh. <laughs> it's killing me. All right, did anybody ever die for lack of data? Anybody ever die in your emergency department for lack of data? You know, it happens all the time. I'll just give you an example of the battle in New Orleans, all right? So it's one of the most decisive victories in the War of 1812. Problem is, it occurred about two weeks after the armistice had been signed because of lack of data. The, the battle never needed to occur, but they couldn't get the information there. And that happens in our emergency departments all the time. How about CPOE? A lot of promise here. These prom CPOE can cut medication errors by 80%. $44 billion. Well, only 4% of hospitals are actually using it. That's probably a little bit higher now. That's probably a little bit dated. Sounds great, right? Well, until you actually look at it, and this was actually an article that, that um, this company's stock dropped about 25% the day this came out. This was Children's Hospital Philadelphia that implemented an, an EMR, and their mortality rate in the pediatric intensive care unit doubled, right, where they implemented CPOE. So again, it's more than the technology, it's also the implementation. Can CPOE, it does have great promise, but Here's the statistics. Only four of 30 had an effect on safety. One in 30 decreased med errors. Three in 30 reduced med cost. Look at all the money, effort, and time that is spent implementing CPOE. Is there any medication that could pass the, the, the effect, efficacy and safety with the FDA with this kind of results? This is the reality, all right? Yet we act like we should do it because it's a computer, okay? So, um, in fact, uh, this is just more evidence of the same, all right? So it's what I call EIatrogenesis, the patient harm caused at least in part by implication of health information technology. And that was actually written up in JAMA, JAMA. So we had George Bush who had his ideas to do this. We now have um, Barack Obama with putting real money, serious money behind it, 19 billion direct, about 40 billion total all up, and about 80 billion pull through. So the 80 billion is the other 40 billion you're going to have to spend to be able to spend the first 40 billion. Now you put 80 billion dollars into something over five years, you're going to create a stir, all right? So we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. What's the impact? A lot of this is going to be directed towards outpatient, towards that 80% of primary care physician offices who have no EMR. Most hospitals already have something. Now they're missing bits and pieces here, CPOE or data exchange or whatever. But here's the deal. You can get $44,000 if you start right now. If you wait, that's what you lose, and then eventually they're going to start charging you and taking money away because you're not using EMRs. 
This is true for hospitals and outpatient physicians. What do you think the effect on primary care and outpatient is going to be with this? There will be those that will adopt. A friend of mine actually just lectured at the, the Family Practice Association and asked the room, right? Only 20% of them are even doing this. The other 80% are just ignoring it. So I think that's the first thing. I also believe it's going to force retirement on a lot of physicians. They're going to say, that's it. You know, I give up. All right. So then there's this whole concept of meaningful use. It's not enough that you just install it. You actually have to have meaningful use. That hasn't even been defined yet. It's supposed to come out at the end of the month. So I, I'm a pretty simple guy. And if I think about a pumpkin, you know, I mean, that's meaningful use, right, of a pumpkin. And it tastes good. All right. We'll see if we can get there with IT. So um, American work environment, 54% were extremely stressed. 49% have some kind of anger. 60% are angry enough to actually hit somebody. And 82% find technology stressful. This is the environment and the human behavior that we have to deal with. This also the impasse study, which is kind of interesting on ED workflow. Does it work? 20 of, of the fastest 20 hospitals had no information system. The 20 slowest all had EDISs. All right? Um, so again, it's a tool, it's not the solution. Um, so this is my emergency department. I'm just going to give you a little flavor for what I used to deal with. So, you know, there's that piece of legacy information that was laying around. And then here's uh, all that uh, secret information, right? It was taped to the wall that people needed, right? Um, that was a hole puncher because we were now able to produce more paper than we ever were before. We had to have a way to manage it. Um, that's my communication device. That's the place to plug everything in. Um, that's lunch. Um, and what's this? Is, this? is this tech looking up the labs for me and helping me manage my patient? No, they're shopping on eBay. All right? <laughs> and uh, so I said, look, I want the internet cut off, and when all the work is done, I'll turn it back on. Okay, was it ever turned back on? All right, um, you got this big box CPU sitting up there. That's a problem. All right? Um, so anything, and, and Jim's going to talk later, anything that puts you close to the patient is good, anything that doesn't is bad. This is my corollary. Technology that puts you close to the patient is good. Technology that takes you away from the patient. So does technology help or hurt? In fact, we have good research now that nurses spend a lot more time with computers than they do patients, and, and increasingly so um, with, with physicians. So who likes it? Who would believe that nurses actually adopt technology, utilize it efficiently, and actually like it? Nobody? Well, that's what this research shows, that actually nurses. It's because of the workflow, right? It doesn't have to do necessarily with their personality or their role. It has to do with their workflows different. Uh, physicians, for the most part, don't. And again, it's because of the way we work, all right? So um, this is an interesting study that was done out of Vanderbilt. Because they were highly technologically advanced, their ER residents, when they went other places that did not have the same technology they felt like they were delivering poorer care. So what we've done is we've taken a, a uh, specialty and those that have the benefit of a car and then have to go out and use a horse and buggy are finding out that they don't have the skills that they need to deal with that. So it can be a challenge. We still have that disparity. So which is it? All right. Let me just check the time here. How am I doing? Pretty close. All right, because what I'm going to do is at some point I'm just going to stop and then we'll pick up where we are. All right, so this, and I'll stop with this one. This has always been my um, indication whether to adopt technology or not. It was the ER show. Now that it's gone, I don't know what I'm going to do. All right, um, but you know, they did digital radiography. You know, well, it was time to do that, right? Um, but at the close in the last show, they were still using the grease board. All right, it's kind of interesting. All right. So, um, actually, let me finish this thought. So you have this, and this is about where we are with EDISs on this adoption curve. You're still, you're not even into the early majority yet. So you're still early. Um, this is actually, this is the Gartner group that you see um, in the hallways here. They produce this hype curve. And so when you get a new idea, you like nobody knows about it. And then, you know, there's this, all these inflated expectations up here. And then, um, then you know, you sort of reach this uh, depression the, thir the, the trough of disillusionment. So look where ED department systems part of an HIS are, all right? Um, look where standalone best of breeds are. They're actually on the plateau. That was last year, all right? This is this year. 
All right, those guys have, are just about at the very bottom and actually the standalone EDSs are off the curve. So they felt like they sort of reached their plateau as good as it's gonna get. All right, so you're gonna be low. So how, what do you do? You do build your own, all right? Well, some people have been very successful at that and in fact, uh, for example, Vanderbilt, this is actually uh, Seattle, I'm sorry, Arkansas Children's Hospital did build their own. They built it for about half the cost of what it was commercial, and they got exactly what they wanted. I think the point of that is that because they were building it, they only built the stuff they actually were going to use, rather than sort of getting all of this you know, candy store and thinking, I want a piece of everything. And they sort of like eat it all, and they get a stomach ache. All right, so they actually did some pretty innovative stuff um, at, at uh, Arkansas Children's, including um, having patients help enter their own information. So should you do a best of breed versus HI? I've already given you my opinion on that. I think best of breed still today meet the needs of emergency departments better than the HISs. Most of the HISs have not developed their own systems. They've just acquired a product and then tried to integrate it. So you still have some of those issues. And, and, and they're just, you know, um, because an HIS has so many moving parts, the emergency department module just does not get the attention and the research dollars that it needs to really be good. Right, that's just my opinion. Um, best of breeds, of course, that's their whole business, and so they do that. Plus, best of breeds are usually private or venture funded, and so some of those are going to go away. Um, interfaces can be an, an, is uh, an issue. HIS, you know, the single source, well, they're usually publicly traded or very large groups, so they're probably not going away, but they, they just have some, some issues. All right, so I'm going to stop there. We will pick up here um, after the next lecture and after the break.